And doing the detective work over on BBC One shortly, Miss Marple, alias Joan Hickson, finds that the strange case of the moving finger proves to be quite a handful. Here on two, in a moment, the world about us visits Pitcairn Island. Tomorrow on two, the first of a series of walks with the popular but reclusive Wainwright. He made the high places of Lakeland accessible to generations of fell walkers. And all his public saw of him was the back view he drew in each of his Lakeland guides. So what height are we now? We're just about the 2,000 mark now. Feet, not metres. I don't recognise metres. I think this adoption of the metric system shouldn't be applied to mountains. I mean, uh, Great Gable has been demoted to something under a thousand now. I think it's disgraceful. It's an affront to Great Gable. Eric Robson walks with Wainwright in Limestone Country tomorrow at 7.40 on BBC Two. We move further afield now with a new series of The World About Us, as Glyn Christian follows in Fletcher's footsteps to discover the bounty inheritance. It hardly seemed possible, but at last we were there, off Pitcairn Island. It seemed so insignificant to be the focus of so much revolution and mystery and blood. Just a tip of rock marooned in the navel of the South Pacific. It had taken me 30 years and cost thousands to get there. It cost Fletcher Christian his country and his life. <laughs> All right, your turn, Mr. Bly. Mr. Christian, I give you your last chance to return to duty. I'll take my chance against the law. You'll take yours against the sea. But you're taking my ship. My ship? Your ship. The king's ship, you mean. And you're not fit to command it. Into the boat. Turn the guns on him! Give him a little bit great! Casting me adrift, 3,500 miles from a port of call, just sending me to my doom, eh? Well, you're wrong, Christian! I'll take this boat as she floats to England if I must! I'll live to see you, all of you, hanging from the highest yard arm in the British fleet. I was nine years old, just a schoolboy in Auckland, New Zealand, when my grandmother took me to see the classic Mutiny on the Bounty film, starring Charles Lawton as Captain Bly and Clark Gable as Fletcher Christian, the Mr. Christian you hear so much about. Of course, until then, I had no idea that I was descended from Fletcher Christian. In fact, that I was his great, 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 great grandson or that a great number of the family roots were in a tiny island in the middle of the South Pacific. That island is Pitcairn, of course, still home of bounty descendants. But I came to Britain from New Zealand in the mid-60s as part of a long-term plan to dig for the nuggets of truth in the avalanche of bounty material published during two centuries. Travel writing and then opening a delicatessen sidetracked me, but Fletcher Christian's island and what happened there remained a passion. Anyway. There were reminders of bounty everywhere, even the local market stalls in Portobello Road. This is where the whole extraordinary story began, with the breadfruit. In the 1780s, the colonies in America were in revolt. One of the effects of that was that the British plantations, mainly sugar plantations in the West Indies, were cut off from essential cheap food for the slaves. One of the solutions was thought to be this, the fabled breadfruit fabled because it was a daily bread you didn't have to work to get. It simply grew on trees. Trouble is that it grew a long way away on an island, part of the world that had only just been discovered in Tahiti. 
1786, George III approved an expedition to bring breadfruit plants from Tahiti to the West Indies in a ship named Bounty. This is the Bounty that MGM had built for the Marlon Brando version of the film. Now it's here in St. Petersburg, Florida, as a tourist attraction. She's a good, solid ship, but you might think pretty small to sail around the world. Fact is that the real Bounty was even smaller, narrower, shorter. She was a squat, converted collier, just 215 tons. Now, even before she sailed, Bounty was unique for two reasons. First, she was a Royal Naval ship that was sailing not for exploration or for conquest, but to bring back the spoils. That hadn't happened before. More importantly, perhaps, for the ultimate story, she was the first naval ship that ever sailed from Britain with a fully volunteer crew. Now, that crew of free-thinking young men is, I reckon, one of the most important ingredients in the recipe for insurrection which followed. And so, undoubtedly, was the ship's commander, Lieutenant William Bly. He'd been in the South Pacific before and had an outstanding reputation as a navigator and for enlightened views on discipline and diet. But when Bounty sailed in December 1787, he felt slighted he'd not been promoted and he'd no officers to share his duties. This is the mainmast, and so we're approximately in the middle of the main or lower deck. Most of the space behind me is taken up by the great cabin, which normally would be where the captain and his officers spent a great deal of their time entertaining, organizing the sailing of the ship, that sort of thing. But here, of course, it had been transformed into an expensive greenhouse lined with lead and set out with little places for 629 breadfruit plants. That meant, of course, that on the voyage out to Tahiti, it couldn't be used. So Bly had to move out and into really what was not a lot better than a little cubby hole out here. And in the space here, Midships is where the midshipmen, of course, and the mates, including Fletcher Christian, would have lived. That's not too bad, in fact. But for most of the men on board, life wasn't good at all. They lived in one great room towards the front of the ship, not perhaps even as much headroom as this, five feet or so. It was dark, there was no natural light or natural air at all, and the space they had, well, look, here's your hammock. That was only unrolled, of course, when you were sleeping in it, because all you had, all anyone had, was this, between 14 and 20 inches of space, depending on which ship you're in. For Bounty's crew, only 45 men, the voyage to Tahiti was more likely to end in death than today's moonshots. First defeated by Cape Horn, Bounty turned tail and battled eastwards, arriving in Matavai Bay in October 1788. <laughs> Like the moon, the overt pleasures and hidden horrors of 18th century Tahiti exceeded even its reputation. They still do, for that matter, with images and tamaray dance rhythms essentially unchanged for 200 years. It took Bounty 10 months to reach Tahiti, and significantly, Bly had promoted Christian to lieutenant and second in command, a sign of the high regard he had for the seamanship of his 24-year-old protégé. I had been commissioned to write the first biography of Fletcher Christian. Having discovered the secrets of his young life in Cumbria, needed to solve the question of his death. Did he secretly return to Britain? The only way I could get to Pitcairn and back in reasonable time was to charter a sailing ship from Tahiti, a nightmare of borrowing solved only hours before I flew south from London. My ship was Tyre, steel-hulled, but with an 18th century rig. From America, New Zealand, Australia and Germany, my crew of 15 arrived. I needed that many so I'd not be blinkered. The more opinions, the better the research. And the Royal Geographical Society had given us their blessing in the name of Sir John Barrow, one of its founders, who wrote the first serious bounty book. I had Tyo for ten weeks, and first I planned a shakedown sail around nearby islands, for few of my lot had sailed before, and one in seven ships are damaged or sunk in the 1,200 miles of archipelago between Tahiti and Pitcairn to the southeast. Until now, we dismissed the elements of danger in this extraordinary chance to visit the world's most remote, permanently inhabited place. But slowly fear surfaced as we sailed from Papeete. 
and already there was virtually no chance of turning back. While I continued my research in my cabin, the team was divided into three watches. As they learned seamanship and absorbed the ethos of Polynesia, they unwittingly also blended into that unique, multi-headed being, a ship's crew. Once they had, we could turn south. We had a wind to catch. Tomorrow, we sail on. And if we're lucky, we get the, the westerly winds, we'll be in Pitkin Island in 10 to 14 days. We may only have about two weeks in Pitcairn. So whatever happens, as from tomorrow, it's going to be tough. We're going to sail fast and direct. And I hope now we're all acclimatized enough to be able to do that without too many problems. So as from this minute, as from this minute, we really are the Sir John Barrett commemorative expedition running away to Pitcairn, which is what the money, the hassle, the heartache, and the seasickness has all been about. And I wish you all of you, bon voyage, good luck, let's do it wonderfully. All right, yeah. fine, that's all right. Yeah. I'll drink to all of you. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> I'm staying here. <laughs> Soon, the normal span of a holiday was well past. Homesickness, seasickness, and the disorienting jar of night watches exposed personal weaknesses, dramatizing the isolation of all such ocean voyages. And then the radios failed, and we had to sail the old, even lonely way. In an unnerving mirror of the past, we were as unnoticed and alone on the Pacific as Bounty had been. We were just as volatile too. Complaints about the food became a touch paper that flashed into a genuine threat of desertion. But this time, a Christian was able to prevent mutiny by cooking every second day. We'd come closer to the bounty experience than expected. Now, we universally understood how an argument over a coconut might have started the mutiny on bounty. And we'd only been at sea for five weeks. The diet at sea in the late 18th century was one of almost unrelieved monotony. Dry biscuits, salt meat, a bit of bad water. And even though Bly tried to do his best to improve that, in fact, he didn't lose a single man through scurvy or malnutrition, food remained an important bone of contention. And this, you see, is where Hollywood has got the story all wrong. It wasn't flogging that made men unhappy at sea. You expected that in the Navy. It was the conditions. It was the food. It was the lack of privacy, the smoke, the darkness, the heat. And on bounty, it was sure knowledge that those conditions were going to last for at least two years. Bounty collected her precious breadfruit shoots in only three weeks, but had to wallow nine months for the right winds to sail home. Christian luxuriated ashore in charge of the breadfruit camp and grew out of his dependence on Bly. Once they sailed, Bly fought to reshape his men back into an obedient naval crew, and he fought with Christian too, demeaning him with slights and accusations of theft. 
proud of his new independence, Christian overreacted. The early morning of April 28, 1789 was a rare one. It was about to be written into history because it was then that Fletcher Christian decided to take the command of bounty from Bly. He arrested Bly downstairs, brought him up, Bly just in his nightshirt, hands tied behind his back with the nightshirt caught up in it. And Christian held him on the end of a rope just in front of the wheel there, like a dog, while they decided what was going to happen. It took most of the day to get it organized for people to decide who was going with Bly in the launch. And eventually, he was put off with 18 men. Extraordinarily, he sailed in that open boat 3,618 miles and eventually got back to England to tell about the mutiny. But what's not as well known is what happened to Bounty. They took nine months to sail around the South Pacific looking for somewhere safe. Eventually, in January 1790, they landed at Pitcairn Island, safe, they hoped, from the revenge of the British Navy and the King. It was a triumph of leadership for Christian. He had blended into a crew an unprecedented mixture of his eight mutineer followers and 18 pagan, fun-loving Tahitian men and women. Seriously short-handed, they nonetheless sailed bounty 8,000 miles in their desperate search for somewhere to hide. Just as there was talk of defeat and return to Tahiti, Christian vacated Pitcairn Island, discovered only a few years before, but so misplaced on naval charts, it wasn't found again for almost 20 years, during which time Christian was supposedly seen back in England. For her amateur sailors, Tayo's arrival at Pitcairn meant the end of a mental and physical challenge far more daunting than they'd imagined. But for me, arrival was the challenge. There are 11 versions of Christian's death and disappearance, and I had to solve this mystery to make my biography of him worthwhile. Our sense of achievement was mixed with wonder at quite how small Pitcairn really is, just a mile by a mile and a half. Yet, as one of Britain's last colonies, she has the same status as the Falklands, or Gibraltar, and Hong Kong. Pitcairn was uninhabited when Bounty arrived, but we were met by a long boat full of faces we recognised from magazine articles. That's Len Brown standing, the island engineer. And that's Warren Christian throwing the lines. And there's yet another Christian at the tiller, that's Steve. <laughs> this is perhaps the best known pit can, Tom Christian decorated by the Queen with an MBE for his services to the community as radio operator, and known throughout the world through his lifeline, Ham Radio Contacts. I was talking to a fellow oh. in the state. Oh, yes, yeah. 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 How are you going to <laughs> There's no hassle of customs or immigration here, merely the last and not inconsiderable peril of battling into Bounty Bay, unprotected by any coral reef from the Pacific's rollers. In the easy way of Polynesia, friendships were quickly made amidst an atmosphere of mutual curiosity of which I was naturally the centre, for we're all cousins of a kind, descended from Fletcher or another of the mutineers. The Pitcairners, though, had the biggest surprise, expecting me to be a tall one like us, and thought virtually everyone else but me, on Tayo, was Glyn Christian. It took only minutes for discreet arrangements to be made about who would stay with which family, and then it was up the long, sticky hill of difficulty to Adamstown, which sprawls for half a mile along the cliff top. We were hauled by tractor, for rain had churned the red volcanic soil into what Pitcairners called the world's friendliest mud, 
It clings so lovingly, you carry a couple of pounds of it on each foot in seconds. The tractor is by turns taxi, truck, and we were happy to find tour bus. The one and a half square miles of pit cairn is so crumpled that not one of us could manage to walk around it in a day. Right in the centre is the radio station, which until mid-1985 used only Morse code officially to contact the world. Other than at Bounty Bay, the island's cliffs make it the fortress hideaway Christian needed. Both tropical and temperate flowers and fruit grow, reflecting the dual roots of black and white, north and south the community has. With a base in what serves as a village square, I began to recreate and walk through Pitcairn's early days by identifying the sites mentioned, a complicated task because Pitcairn names constantly change. The names vary here. Some are botanical, some are historical, some are geographical, like where John catch the cow. I'm not too sure who John is or which cow it is, but apparently there were cattle here in those days. There's one down there which we call the ugly name place that's down at Rope. And uh, the real name is Gila Totra, which is an ugly name, you see. Like Palva Valley. Palva Valley is a plant. Some of the names have been changed down where we live. It's known as Down Fletchers, which is really Down Fletchers, Fletcher Christian. The Pitcairn as English retains 18th century vowels, giving an almost West Country accent. And they've their own language too, which never having been written, is constantly adapted. The mutineers, they couldn't speak Tahitian, and the Tahitians couldn't speak English, and so they had this in-between language. And where are you going? We'd say about your Gwen. And where have you been? We'd say about your Ben. Some words are Tahitian. If you're clumsy, we'd say you're Ama Ula. <laughs> Well, we just asked, we were just trying to find out, and everybody knew us. Oh, who's going? Let us see you. Who's going to go to the engine? Nobody, I asked who left us prosperity has always relied on passing ships. Once as many as 80 a year helped the survival of a community of over 150. But the 20th century started miserably with few ships until twice monthly calls by passenger liners brought a relative so boom. Nothing. <laughs> then 25 years ago, the jet replaced them. Now, irregular supply ships struggle to support only 50 people. Betty Christian. We grew up with the benefit of uh, being able to get a lot of things from outside. Foods, clothes. Uh, different things like that, that the young people in, the, in my parents' age had never probably seen or heard of. And it was difficult for them. The work here uh, locally was harder in that uh, they had to spend more time in the gardens growing more things because they couldn't buy uh, readily available foods like we can nowadays. I've heard my mother say that then only a few whaling ships would stop by and it was considered very fortunate if a man could get two shirts of the same colour on board a ship so that then the woman of the house would be able to make the two shirts into a dress for herself. Now I guess it must have been a lot harder for them. From the day he took bounty, Christian's followers were given a say in what happened to them. A British Revolution afloat, preempting what was to happen also to France in 1789. His descendants continued that democracy, voting as one to convert to Seventh day Adventism in 1870. Saturday remains the Sabbath, when no work or cooking is done, and most go to church twice. All right, I think now we're ready for our uh, hymn of praise, and it's Sweet Hour of Prayer 316. 300 and 16. <laughs>
Christianity, which has so long bound this community, was first cobbled together by the last mutineer alive, Adams. After a period of bloodshed and promiscuity, he banished alcohol and converted his flock of Tahitian women and half-caste children into the most God-fearing community the Victorians knew. It proved, they said, there was salvation through Christ, and Queen Victoria sent them an organ, but not the missionaries they'd asked for. This is the Bible Adams used to invent Pitcairn's first Christianity, with two fast days weekly, so that children fainted digging crops they couldn't eat. Thank you. It's an, it's an amazing experience for me to do this. It's, it's, it's the one thing that, that really one hears about and sees, and I'm so amazed that it's so little. It looks like it's been quite well worn, too. Yes, about <laughs> 200, more, probably more than 200 years it is. Yeah. yeah. Although known as the Bounty Bible, it's too small to be a ship's yes. Bible and is perhaps the one given to Fletcher Christian by his mother. So, from a secure peace created by a reformed mutineer and drunkard, and with a pidgin language, Pitkin developed into a Polynesian community with its heart in Britain, a place which fascinates even the youngest. I went to school with pictures of Fletcher's birthplace. In the middle of it, and this is like a castle. It's all, it's all got battlements. Well, originally, you see those big walls all around there? This was a fortification, and the house was in there because it's close to the border of Scotland. When, when the Scots came down, they couldn't ride their horse in to surprise them. They had to get off their horse first, and that's why it was so low. There's lots of pictures of that. And you can see it better there, you see? This is the outside of it, and that was the main road, and that's a really little door to get into that great big place. And this was the lookout. Lots of big hills like Pitcairn. You see, that's the house where he was born house here. And no one knows how old these walls are. This house was built in about uh, 250 years ago, more than close, oh, wow. 1709. Oh, but these walls could be six or 700 or even 800 years old. In Bounty Bay, my team's divers had permission to look for Bounty's wreck. She'd burned at anchor two weeks after arriving in January 1790. Some say it was accidental, some that she was set alight, and she was only found again in 1956. But almost two centuries of the Pacific's pounding had left the divers little more than iron ballast bars to see. The useful contents of the ship had been landed before Bounty burned, but all the islanders now have is a hoard of copper nails and pieces of the copper sheathing which protected Bounty's hull from shipworm. As far as I can ascertain, many of her artifacts were given away to early visitors, almost all of whom were American whalers and sealers, so it's in their homes and museums on the west and east coast of America that many bits and pieces belonging to Bounty and her men must lie, perhaps unrecognized. That's a cannonball. A cannonball, yeah. Do you think it could be? Yeah, it's got to be. Cover plate. This looks like a nail. Cover plate. Dog collar. You reckon? What's yeah. that? What's that? <laughs> 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 you heard about how hard the English biscuits were. It's a donut. It's an English donut. <laughs> uh, they, they used to have to take their savers. <laughs> great, great. It's from the bounty. This is for the original cover plate. It is, right? This is a bounty nail. The Pitcairner's initial enthusiasm for such relics diminished when pleas for help and preservation went unheeded. Cannons and swivel guns now rot in backyard sheds. Dominating Adamstown is Christian's Cave, where he's supposed to have recovered after being shot in the first of the island's massacres in 1793. 81-year-old Andrew Young helped sort out possibility from fiction. You can't see any of the trees, so this, you say, is after the big slip in 1845. 1845. Because that's really quite different to what these other pictures show, isn't it? 
Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a, this is a picture from 1925, which I think must be before you said that the slide of the Earth. Oh which yes, we, that that's long before. We can't see that. But if we stand up, can we see where that went from now? Oh yes, I see. Oh yeah, it's quite easy to see where all the slips came down, isn't it? All the way down there. Yeah. And you think that there were some trees on the other side as well? The old good people said that whole place was covered up with trees. And Fletcher got down from the top. He, he came come... down from the top, hanging by the trees, coming down, and he found that cave. Yeah. And so you say that in those days you couldn't, uh, you couldn't see the cave. You can't see it. He told his wife, sure that his cave, wife where the cave is. So in ch at any chance the ships come and took them away, she knew where to take the women and hide. So. If if a, if a ship came to take the mutineers away, the women and the children yeah, would still be safe. safe. They know where to hide. The climb revealed it as not a cave, but a scoop from the cliff. It was easy to understand the stories of Christian using it as a place to brood his fate, but as a safe hideaway, it's too small, tree shielded or not. We took metal detectors to comb the thin ledge in front of the cave, looking for signs of a supposed hut or arms cache or of Bounty's gold. A single nail was our reward for two days' work. Goat hunts are now the closest Pitcairners get to the dreadful days when jealousy between Tahitians and mutineers over women, exacerbated by drinking homemade spirit, meant all but two of the 15 male settlers were murdered in a horrifying series of manhunts and massacres. Tension and fear of treacherous ambush on the tracks of this tiny island was so terrible the women couldn't bury the bodies of the men killed in the first massacre for almost a year, and thus perhaps started the legends of Christian's escape. The bones of those men, and the others, are somewhere under Pitcairn soil, unmarked. Only Adams, who became patriarch, has a grave. With no safe haven for shelter from the treacherous, untrammeled winds, Tayo had to be manned continuously, and her anchorage changed constantly. During an overnight tropical storm, huge seas threw our captain, Terry Perkis, and seriously injured his back. At first light, the Pitcairner's awesome seamanship was offered to bring him ashore. This is generosity and bravery beyond call. Getting out of Bounty Bay is danger fraught in calm weather, and remember, an accident to even a few of the men in this boat puts the entire community in jeopardy. Once Terry was off Tayo, the winds worsened. The boat couldn't get back into Bounty Bay, so headed for the only other landing site, Ted's side, requiring a terrifying surf directly onto the rocks. Mm -hmm. 
After that buffeting, the tractor was considered too uncomfortable, so the pit canners carried him across the island. I had a, a bit of a lapse about a year after the operation. The Pitcairner's altruistic rescue of Terry helped avoid the need for surgery the island had no facilities to offer anyway. Rest repaired the damage. If it hadn't, we would have had to leave him behind, hoping some charitable captain might rescue him. Life on Pitcairn suddenly seemed less attractive when we saw how tenuous is its hold on modern health care. W6IL, W6IL. This is VR6TC, Victor... Until 1985, most medical advice was obtained illicitly by Tom's ham radio, and serious illness still requires a grant from the island council to go to New Zealand, if there's a ship. Okay, W6IL, VR6TC, good morning, Ralph, and uh, thank you. Our young patient is doing very well. Thank you for contacting the doctor, and uh, the nurse is very happy about the progress. Pitcairn Island, Pacific Ocean, August 1918. Dear Island Council, the purpose of this letter is to apply for a compassionate grant of Christie Warren to go to New Zealand for medical reasons on the next down chair. I feel that he can be helped by going. Any question as far as we are concerned, and we're disapproving of the compassionate grant, I, I think that is very essential for us as a guild to approve anything that has been recommended by the medical officer. There has been some unfortunate cases, like my 15-year-old sister. She developed appendicitis, and even though a ship got in, the appendix had ruptured. And they operated. Uh, she died about three or four days, four days, I think, after the operation. Nowadays, I hate to say just what might happen if there is a real emergency like that. We would get on the radio, of course, and seek help as quickly as possible, but the chances of a doctor being uh, just off on a ship these days seems to be very remote. We'd have to trust to luck and the good Lord and antibiotics, I guess. Recent medical tests have revealed a widespread problem of diabetes in spite of a life of activity from dawn to dusk. The passenger ships, which once called fortnightly, were a source of income from the sale of handicrafts, both those of their Tahitian ancestors and of wood carvings, a skill taught them by a visitor after the Last World War. We all wanted souvenirs, and a supply ship was also expected, so the island was abuzz with the sounds of industry wherever you went. The post office was soon stuffed with letters and packages for correspondence all over the world. These sales, and of their attractive stamps, are the only opportunities pitcairners have for entrepreneurial income. But the demands made by fishing and their vegetable gardens compete cruelly for their valuable time. With no anchorage here, bad weather can mean even the official supply ships sail straight past. Unofficial callers, often the only ones to bring goods from Britain, can't stop and merely reduce speed. But day or night, good weather or bad, the pit canners must go out to survive.
Today there were blue skies, but the usual very heavy swell. Yet the sole way up remains a sickeningly swinging rope ladder. Only 80-year-old Christy Warren, going to hospital in Auckland, three and a half thousand miles away, used a safety harness. Proud once of having been the strongest man on the island, Christy climbed the heaving ship's side almost unaided. It's a matter of pride for a pitcairner always to be able to climb aboard, of pride and of personal income. I found it strangely moving to see these supplies, some ordered, some acquired serendipitously, being taken off in woven baskets and on rope, just as our ancestors had done from Bounty. These are no crocodile tear farewells. The young get seduced by jobs of the 20th century. The old fear more recurring illness if they return. Too often, these are the last good lines. And he's doing well. How, how does that sound, Ralph? Is that okay, W6IL, VR6TC? Now that I'm some 800 miles west I don't really know uh, what is the future of Pitcairn. I think it's hard to predict. The shipping seems to be getting fewer. Another thing that seems to be getting more important uh, as far as the folks are concerned here, that the cost of living here is high now with freight charges on non-food stuffs. And that is if we want to live to a somewhat European standards. It becomes very expensive to get building material in here because of the, the shipping costs. And uh, it would be hard to go back to the island or the native way of life to just live off the land. In fact, I think that would be very difficult. With uh, our standards now, with refrigerators and deep freezers and well, so many things that uh, we take for granted now. Push up my hat, me. From an education point for the children and growing up, we will have to consider, I think, seriously moving if we want our children to be well educated. And even on Pitcairn, I think this is important in this age to get a reasonably good education. There are some advantages out on a small remote island, maybe. It seems to be ideal for rearing young children. But uh, there comes a time, I guess, when we have to make the choice. Uh, be remote and away from the rest of the world, or be with it. Perversely, better education is precisely what keeps the young away. Now, more sensitive administration subsidizes building, and Tom has finished a new house. But will his children grow old in it? Ever since we got on this island here, we've been hearing talk, talk, talk about this game called Brocade or Crockett or something like that. So, just to show you that we ain't afraid of nobody. We have put up the official <laughs> IO Cup. Well, it's an official challenge. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just leave it in here somewhere and then we'll come collect it and sail away with it after we win. If we don't win, we'll steal it. <laughs> Where'd you get it? We believe this to be an official soup bowl off the bounty. <laughs> Well, we expect all our local fellas to come up there on Monday and we won't even give them a challenge. <laughs> and we accept the challenge. Hey. 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 It's a team. We stick together. Raise your right. attention, please, everybody. Mr. Glenn Christian will read the rules for the Tayo team. Yeah. <laughs> First rule no cheating. <laughs> Local umpire's decision is final. <laughs> and now I think the uh, alternative or other side's rules. Are we going to time to read our rules here, people? Yes. <laughs> okay. Can you read? Not read. 
Now okay. listen carefully. My pit can team. Play normal and keep changing to a, me a minimum. <laughs> That's all. Up Puliander is the nearest thing Pitcairn has to a village cricket green. Its dusty bumps appreciated only by the baseball educated Americans of Tyo's Lions. <laughs> Lunch and tea time were as relaxed as the rules, but having been beaten by several hundred runs, the Lions were rewarded with a Pitcairn specialty, a public dinner, to which everyone brought yet more food. Here's the team. Really good. Thank you very much. And we appreciate that you know that you were playing against half team of cripples. And, <laughs> and the guy with one arm, he scored 10 points. <laughs> in public and at home, the Pitcairners still eat in the style of 18th century Britain and Tahiti, with everything, sweet and savoury, served at the same time. The food's a wonderful cultural mix too. Lettuce or wild beans, dressed with coconut milk deep-fried chips of breadfruit and curried goat, guava turnovers and duff, the boiled bread dough of the Georgian Navy, but here sweetened with pineapple. I came to Pitcairn in search of Fletcher Christian, and I'm convinced he did die here. But I left with a more important discovery. Today is Pitcairners. They cocoon visitors with a trust and friendship the 20th century rarely sees. There are no locked doors, no crime. But the constant laughter masks the knife edge of insecurity upon which they daily balance. Theirs is one of the world's best known islands, with a literature of over two and a half thousand major books and articles, and feature films costing millions, a two century old industry grown fat of their bounty inheritance but they've never seen a penny of it. 1990 will be Pitcairn's bicentenary as a British colony. Improvements are being made, but Pitcairn remains a fragile paradise, deeply cracked by complacent neglect and dangerously close to shattering. But government can't do everything. If I had my way, everyone who has ever benefited from writing about it, anyone who has ever been thrilled by the films or books, would give back something so that Pitcairn survives. I'm determined to keep my promises, to help ensure Pitcairn's survival and to return. When I do, I want finally to find and mark the grave of Fletcher Christian. Surely, the founder of this unique inheritance, whose story has fired the imagination of millions of men and women over almost two centuries, deserves something better than an unmarked pit. Or is the great lonely rock of Pitcairn the most extraordinary mausoleum one revolutionary young man ever had? <laughs> <laughs>